I think I got all the dust off. Will Robinson here from Robinson's Auto Tools and Time.com. Welcome back. Sorry once again for the delaying videos. Yes, I'm doing well. Everything is fine. So thank you to everyone that has reached out with concerns. But here we are once again, hoping to pick this back up for you guys and take you along with this adventure today, which is a 2005 Chevy Trailblazer with a complaint that he wants me to chase today. I guess there's a couple issues going on with this. He just picked up the vehicle, but one that he's been chasing personally is the secondary air injection. And I guess there's one other code in there that he's gonna chase later, but he's kinda went through all of his options that he can think of. Now he's at a dead end and he asked if we could take a look at it. So we're gonna dive in there, we're gonna pull up some codes, verify the complaint, and see what we could do to help this guy out. Diagnostics, GN. Gotta make sure you turn the key on first. That would help. 2005 light truck, Chevy, 4.2. Yes, the ECU. Read the codes. P0410, secondary air injection system. And so, we definitely do have a problem there. Uh, the other code is the P0014, which is exhaust camshaft position system performance. We are not gonna be looking at that today, maybe later. Let's take a quick overview of what will set the P0410. So, a little theory of operation, the PCM can detect an airflow system airflow fault by monitoring the heated oxygen sensor, bank one, sensor one, during normal operation, engine operation. This is an active test. The PCM will command the air system on during closed loop operation. The active test will pass or fail based on the response from the heated oxygen sensor one. The active test consists of three test runs at three second intervals. A decrease in oxygen sensor voltage response indicates the secondary air system is functioning properly. If the PCM does not detect a decrease in response from the oxygen sensor one, a DTC 410 will be set. Okay, so it runs three consecutive tests when it's in the closed loop mode and it's looking for a drop in sensor voltage. All right, I have the vehicle warming up here for a little bit, save you some time. So looking at the theory of operation, we want to make sure we're in closed loop. And that means the O2 sensors are warmed up. And she is in closed loop at the moment. So we're going to go back out of here. We're going to go one more active test. we go into engine and then we're going to go to the secondary air injection system looking at the theory of operation you can see they brought up all this valuable data for us because we are going to look at the heated oxygen sensor number one and as you can see we're switching close to 900 down to say 39 900 down to 40 you know so we'll say 900 down to 40 um, we're going to take and turn on the air injection system now so we're going to command it on and we want to see the O2 sensor 1 pull down and stay down there while the injection system is on because we're going to flood the system with some extra air so we're going to turn that on we see it did pull down for a second but it went right back up and the O2 sensors are just compensating for something that it can compensate for. Um, what you would normally see here is that pull down and stay down for this duration. And that is not the case. So I do hear something clicking underneath the hood. We're going to go out there and see exactly what is firing. All right, now that we're under the hood, I'm just taking a quick observation, I see that there's a, a new control module. A new solenoid for the air injection. Um, we have been told that the pump has been replaced as well. So I think the first thing we're going to do is um, bring up a wiring schematic and see what's all involved in this system. 
Okay, I brought up the schematic of the secondary air injection system. And I believe we got everything here that we need. I just made, just printed out a copy of it. So I think we're going to start at the under hood fuse block, left side of the engine compartment. So let's jump out there, make sure fuse 54 and 60 are good. We'll be using a regular test light with a light bulb. It's pretty important to me because I could see a little bit of a load on the circuit. I mean, it's not foolproof. It's not a heavy load. If I feel a need to put a little bit more additional load on it, I'll show you a test light that I made actually recently. And we're going to start with fuse 54. Let's look in here is 54. So this will be right here. Good, good. So that fuse is good. Next, fuse 56, which is a 60 amp. 56 is located right here. It's one of these big fuses. And as you can see, the top has been popped off it. So I can go in there and check both sides. Usually you can't get to the top of that fuse, but someone has the top side off. But you can get a visual through the uh, transparent top and see that the, the fuse is visually good. And we just confirmed it again with this test light. Seems like it's lighting nice and bright. I'm not seeing like a connection issue per se, but we still don't know what's going on in the rest of the circuit. So where would, where would you go next? Well, with the scan tool I have, I could do an activation test. So what I'm going to do is activate it and see if we could hear this relay in this panel. Activate. And that's relay 55, which is this middle one here. Okay, we'll jump in here. Well, we could hear that firing. So we could have skipped checking that fuse by doing this activation test because in order for this relay to fire, this fuse, it's hard to read off the paper, but fuse 54 needs to be good because it's power at all time. Well, power and run and start and then ground side switch from the PCM, which has been replaced already. And we know that's working. We can hear the solenoid valve firing on the opposing side. I'll give you a shot of that. Right here's the solenoid valve. I can feel it and hear it. That side of the circuit is working fine. What I don't hear is the injection pump, the actual pump turning on. So we just verified that everything is good on the solenoid side of the circuit. All the control and the load evidently is good because it is firing. Now we're going to jump over to the pump side of the circuit and we do not hear this pump turning on when we do the activation test. So we're going to have to get down there. It, the pump is located on the frame rail, driver side, uh, pretty much underneath the driver side door I'd say right around that area. Along with this relay, we got to locate where that's at, and it says it's on the frame rail. So let's get underneath the vehicle. We'll go down here and do some checks. We know the fuse is good. That puts the load to it. Control should be good because it's coming off of the same power as um, the other relay up top for the solenoid valve. So power to the control side should be good. But we don't know if we have control coming from wherever it comes from. But we'll check it. Okay, so under the vehicle, left side, frame rail, pretty much near the driver's door, you'll find the air pump, which you can see has been replaced already. So essentially everything in the system has been replaced, so it's new. This is usually the problem child. So, um, I believe this is the relay that we're gonna wanna do some basic checks on. Control, power, ground, plus make sure our load side is getting down here and switching, of course. So 
Let's take a look at the schematic and see what to check first. We'll verify this is the relay by the color codes. Now we're down to the pump side of the circuit. We are going to look for a pink and a brown. That's going to be our control side of the air pump relay. And then we also have those two red conductors that we've seen on there. Pretty big conductors. Um, we'll see which one has power presently without it energized. And then we'll know which one is what. But pink should definitely have 12 volts coming from fuse 54. Alright, we're underneath looking up at the re relay. Let's go right for the load side right away. So I have nothing here. Hopefully I have a good ground. Let me check that. Nothing there. So let's check the other side. Well, you can see we have power on that side. Okay, so with the test light illuminated at this point, that's telling us that fuse 56 is indeed good. So we checked fuse 56 while we were up there. We came down and we verified that it's good all the way up to the contact, or all the way up to the plug at least, on this relay. So when we energize it, it should switch over to the other big red conductor, which will go down to the pump and turn that pump on as long as we have a good ground and the pump is good. Next, let's just switch it over to the other big red conductor and then we'll activate it and see if we have power. So we're gonna simply back probe there as well. What the hell happened? All right, so now I'm gonna take and activate it. I can hear it turn the solenoid valve on up top. But you see the test light is not turning on, it's not illuminating. And I do not hear this relay clicking. So the power is not going to the pump. It's never going from this conductor to the other conductor. So we got to see if we have our control side working properly. So next we got to check our control side because evidently it is not switching for some reason. So that pump will never turn on in this state, in this condition. So what we got to do is make sure we're getting power down to the relay coming from fuse 54. And that is the pink wire. As you can see, we do indeed have power present on the pink wire. So we have power coming down to the fuse. It is making it to the plug. Now we got to, well, know what I got to do guys? I got to leave this one in there. We got to leave that back probe in there because now what I need to check that ground side to make sure the control module is indeed pulling it to ground is I'll need to hook up a power. So we're going to rob the power from here. And what that will allow me to do is when I find a good ground, it'll illuminate the test light. Just like that. So now we're going to see if we are indeed getting the control side switch. And then we will take it from there. So I'm going to take and back probe the black wire next. Or the brown wire, I should say. So now we have the controlled ground, which should come on when I activate it. As you can see, it does. So we are getting our control side. This relay is not firing. Is it really that simple, guys? Do we have a bad relay? And this relay was never checked. Grab me a screwdriver handy. I'm going to pop this plug out. Oh, wow. That has not been touched in quite some time. The contacts have a lot of green crusties on them. Say we're going to need to replace that relay. Also, clean these connections up. 
just take with me to make sure they give me the right one. Alright, on the back side of this is a little tab. Boop. We're gonna take a pop it off because we'll need that. Alrighty, tidy. We got a part here from Napa. Um, I cleaned the plug up a little bit. You know, I just sprayed some contact cleaner in there. The terminals don't seem that bad. So we're going to plug her in. Um, if everything's good, I'll take it apart and I'll put some grease on there. Some sort. Fits. Moment of truth. Woo, buddy! Wasn't really that easy. Well, now you know the sound I was listening for when we fired it from up top. But we also have a little leak here. So before we even So I'm glad we didn't just call it a fix and put everything up together because that would have been leaking like a sieve. Um, appears it just wasn't clipped in all the way. There you go. Let's see what we got. O ring feels good. That's better. Well, that would have gave us a problem for sure. Got some marine style contact um, grease. So you can pick it up at, I got this stuff from Wells a long time ago. They sent it with a, with a package they sent me. However, you get any kind of electrical contact grease to try to keep the elements out of the contacts. And um, so you don't have that problem again, even though just for demonstrations, I want to pull apart that relay because I don't think it was a contact problem. You know, it looked green and a little crusty. We wiggled it around. We did some things. There's, the pin fitment feels great. It's a pretty heavy duty um, contacts in there. I believe we'll find more once we pop that relay open. However, let me unplug this. It shows you it's, it's a pretty good tight seal. And in case you're ever wondering, not sure where I got these in many many years but it's a um, precision file set and it's they're you get in there pretty good this is the one I was using you see it's a little janked up but um, depending on the pin fitment and how bad they are sometimes I'll get in there and I'll, I'll just clean them up a little bit. And sometimes I'll get in there with a pick and uh, pull that little tab. There's like a little tab there that puts like a spring pressure against the terminal. And I'll put a little bit more pressure, bend them out so it has a little bit more pressure. You just don't want to go forcing something too thick down in there because then you'll spread them open and create another problem. I sprayed contact cleaner in there. 
Another thing you gotta be careful of, certain contact cleaners will brittle plastic. So put your little straw tip on there and pss, 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 pss. you know, try not to spend too much time on the plastic. Check that one more time. We have this clip. It'll go in there like that. Remember, right, I bent this tab out, so I'm gonna bend that back in. So now it's sticking out. Essentially, Okay, feels good. All right, we're gonna double check the work up top and then maybe we'll do a little more verification. Okay, and then you might say, okay, well, this is great if I have that fancy scan tool with bi-directional control, you make it look easy. Well, what I would do if I didn't have my bi-directional control scan tool with me, I would still check all my powers and grounds, right? On this case, I didn't have to check the ground because I was missing the power, so I didn't even go to the next step. All my powers were good, and my control side ground switch wasn't there, but when I activated it, it came there. So I knew the problem was somewhere we had to get past this point before we could even think about going further because it would make no sense to go to the next step when we already came across one problem. So taking one step at a time got us to where we are right now. But what if I didn't have that? Well, you could wait for the cycle to go and then hopefully you catch it within that few seconds, 30 seconds, whatever you might have to listen for it to come on or you can do this. We're gonna take and we're gonna back probe the control side ground switch like we did earlier, okay? Now what does the computer do? What is it doing to turn that on? It's grounding it, right? So at this point, sure, you could take this and stick it to a ground and hopefully everything will click and fire on because we just completed the circuit inside the control side and it is doing just what the computer would do and grounding it. However, to be safe, we're gonna use a test light because we don't wanna take any chances of damaging something. So we'll take the test light, we'll ground it. Now, what it's gonna do is find the ground through the filament of that light bulb. Um, if we have the polarity crossed or something, it will simply just light the light bulb. If everything's good, hopefully we'll have just enough ground going through that light bulb. Hook it up to ground like so. So it found its way through the light bulb to ground and we just energized that coil inside that relay, the control side. We just mimicked what the computer would do and gave it a ground. So essentially that's how you can test the relay without uh, triggering the, the command, but what's nice about a bi-directional scan tool is that you could test the circuit in its entirety and make sure even the control is working, the rest is up to the logic within itself. To perform its test as, as necessary from here on out, but we could say mechanically, at this point, everything is good, it's firing, well electrically, we don't know about all the hoses, any leaks, um, the work they did up top. It's gonna to have to run its cycle. We could, we could try monitoring a couple things. Let's do that. Okay, so it runs three consecutive tests when it's in the closed loop mode and it's looking for a drop in sensor voltage. So that sums it up pretty well. Okay, now we just verified that the loop status is in closed loop. That means that the Oxygen sensors are up to temperature and controlling. Okay, so now that we're over at the vehicle, 
We're going to monitor heated oxygen sensor number one. And you can see it's switching from, I'd say, almost 900 down to 40. You can see it's switching, right? Almost 900 to 40, roughly. So what happens when we energize that pump, the whole entire system in its entirety, it's going to turn on that solenoid valve. It's also going to fire the pump. We're going to put some air into the engine. And what the computer is going to look for is that O2 sensor voltage to drop. So let's see if we fix the problem. There you go. You see our O2 sensor voltage drop. It is not recovering, so we're going to turn that back off. And you can see it instantly comes back and starts responding. Once again, the system's going to try to compensate for that extra air, and then it's going to start switching back and forth, just like we would expect to see. So we're going to turn it back on, verify it one more time. You can see it pulled the voltage down to four. And turn it off. And now it's going to start responding once again. And we'll do it three times. That way, hey, that's what the computer's gonna do later anyway, but only in three second intervals. So you may trip a code doing this, but we'll go in there and we'll clear. That's gonna wrap it up for today. I hope you guys maybe pulled some valuable information out of this. Even though to me, once I got down there and I found it was something pretty basic, I almost thought, is this video worth putting out there? Evidently, hopefully it holds some value for somebody. There's a lot of things that are questionable, like why this, why that? Did the air pump go bad and it took out the relay? We're gonna pop that open here in a second. Or was it the relay the whole time? Why was the solenoid valve replaced? But I don't want you guys to go there. What I want you guys to try to pull from this video, if anything, is the value of a good wiring schematic. And knowing how to decipher that schematic and knowing how to do some basic checks to prevent certain things from happening. Like I guess you could say, what if it's not the pump? What if it's not the solenoid valve? You could take all those what ifs out before even replacing any parts. And that's the, that's the whole objective of this video. So we're gonna wrap this up. I'll take it for a ride. We'll see if we can confirm it by the monitors being cleared. But we did do three consecutive tests. I know it's not in the same conditions as it would if it ran it on its own. However, I feel pretty confident in this repair, and I think that is going to be behind us now. But he probably has much deeper problems when it comes to that, to that other code that's in there. But I hope you guys enjoyed. Let's take apart that relay. I'm curious to see what's going on inside. Here we are. We got the old relay. And we're going to try to pop it out of there. I gotta get a bigger screwdriver. That baby ain't cutting it. First, second, third. That was never gonna work. Well, there's your problem. This contact, this terminal had no place to go. But even the windings are separated, broken. I'll show you what I'm just hanging out there in the open. Yeah. So, there's a good chance. It just may have been the problem from the get-go. This is more of like a water intrusion issue, I think. Yeah, so 